Thank you very much uh, for coming, uh, uh, Mr. Jewell. Uh, are we starting with you? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, another one third of our funds go into uh, clean water, and uh, and uh, so we're going to hear from from you folks today that uh, there's a water council that's set up, and they've also been meeting and meeting and meeting. I, you can tell us about how many and uh, and uh, looking after the funds. Uh, you're funded by for the biennium, uh, usually, and uh, you know traditionally, and uh, so a lot of their funds were received last cycle. But, Mr. Jewell, uh, um, thank you for uh, coming down. I hope you were up in Duluth voting for uh, uh, Chair Murphy yesterday, or <laughs> no. Mr. Jewell. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair Lilly and members. I also want to thank uh, two of uh, your members who have served on the Clean Water Council, uh, Representative Wiginius for two years prior to this, and recently Representative Heinzman. Um, we gain a lot from our interactions with and the feedback we receive from um, the House and the Senate members who are part of it and more broadly other members. Our uh, council is uh, made up of a group of citizen members with uh, two members of the House and two members of the so Senate who are non-voting. And then we also have uh, members from the agencies who are also non-voting but give us additional advice as to uh, items that um, uh, are of importance. Um, last year, um, the council, in collaboration um, uh, with others, uh, decided to hire an administrator. Prior to that, we had had staff, but they didn't uh, have some of the abilities that we saw as really important, one of them being reaching out to legislators. Um, Paul Gardner is that new administrator and has really helped in our outreach to uh, the uh, House and Senate where he was once a House member. Um, the, um, uh, I think the important pieces that we want to talk about is give you a sense of what the work we're doing, our process for moving forward with our recommendations to you next year. Um, and to tell you that we have been really working on a strategic plan that will produce um, what we want uh, money to start flowing toward and measurable outcomes that we can have that will actually show what we're getting done. Um, there are many views about what it would be best for us to do. Um, and there are more than 72 programs that get funded through the Clean Water Council. Um, those all have importance. Um, and Paul is going to kind of walk you through more uh, of what that looks like. So I'll hand it over to Paul. Mr. Gardner. Thank you. Welcome uh, back and uh, congratulations on your new job. And or I suppose it's been over a year now, maybe. Or uh, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, 13 months. And uh, I've noticed since the last time I served here that you've changed all the locks. My keys don't work <laughs> <laughs> anymore. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, for the record, my name is Paul Gardner. I'm the administrator for the Clean Water uh, Council. As you heard from uh, Commissioner Jewell, we have uh, 17 voting members that uh, by statute are from particular constituencies. Uh, we also have uh, 11 non-voting members, including agencies uh, such as the PCA, Bowser, DNR, Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, the Metropolitan Council, as well as four legislators in the University of Minnesota. And we also work with the Public Facilities Authority. Uh, every two years, we recommend how to spend the Clean Water Fund. So we thought that in a non-budget year, that it would be a good time without the deadlines looming to just uh, fill you in, because one thing we heard loud and clear from people at the Capitol as well as other stakeholders outside state government is they weren't always quite sure how all the line items in the legacy bill fit together into something that actually gets us towards measurable outcomes in drinking water and fishable and swimmable water. So we'd like to rectify that. We've been doing some other things and so we'd like to share that with you today. Uh, the main problem we're trying to solve has to do with non-point source pollution. 
Uh, we are supposed to advise on the implementation of the Clean Water Legacy Act, which has to do with uh, impairments in our water. Impairments is uh, our way of saying water pollution in some ways, but they're 85% um, uh, of them come from non-point sources. Simply put, those are small amounts of pollutants that, uh, when accumulated over the uh, size of a watershed, accumulate into a big problem and keep our waters from being fishable, swimmable, swimmable and drinkable. The big three contaminants we're concerned about are sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, these uh, contaminants come not only from uh, rural parts of the state, but urban and suburban communities as well. Uh, e. coli and coliform are two examples of bacteria that we're concerned about that can certainly cause problems with uh, waters not being drinkable or swimmable. And they often come from sources like uh, failing septic systems and uncontained livestock. Here in the metro area, one of our major contaminants of concern is um, uh, chloride, uh, mostly from uh, de-icers, although it does come from uh, some other sources as well. Uh, we have a very fancy um, chart and system and a work research paper that was done years ago saying how we will clean up the water and get out our uh, pollutants. Uh, however, I find that most of that tends to make people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> and so uh, I'll try and use plain language as much as I can in this uh, slide. So the way in which the state approaches cleaning water and getting at those impairments is to first test the water to see if there's something wrong with it, then figure out what the source of that problem may be, come up with a plan for how to solve that impairment and get rid of it. If necessary, train people to have the capacity to be able to fix the problem. Uh, if landowners are needed as uh, uh, people who can reduce non-point source pollution, uh, the state and its local uh, partners, particularly soil and water conservation districts, work with landowners to figure out what they need to do to act to make things better. In some cases, a protection strategy is appropriate, and that can mean setting aside land instead of farming it, uh, putting it in a conservation program as an example. And then the fun stuff is always the, rest, the restoration. That's where you take something that was eroding or a steam stream that was turned into a ditch and turn it back into a stream of again. Uh, moving dirt is the phrase that uh, people often use to describe what we do there. Uh, we have an example there with a the lakeshore restoration uh, in the picture. And then after that, the MPCA works uh, not just with state employees, but several 1,300, 1,400 volunteers who actually test water quality on an annual basis in lakes and streams. Uh, I think we, you, we have to be out of here at 2.15, Mr. Chair? Yep. So uh, I timed it at 16 minutes. I hope that's all right. And then we can have questions. Okay. Uh, I consolidated a few things here. So uh, in addition to all Mr. the- Mr. Gardner, we have a question. Our Representative Wagenia Sykes. Mr. Chair, I just was wondering if we were going to have time for questions or, or not. I, Mr. Gardner, please. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I was time born for 15 minutes to talk and 15 minutes for questions. So. But I think we if, I, we can do it during or it after at, or at quarter after. So there won't be time for questions. No, I think he's going to present for another ten minutes and then we'll or another few minutes and then. Right. We'll have time for questions. I, I will shorten it up, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, in terms of planning to how to deal with the impairments. Um, the PCA sums everything up in something called a watershed restoration and protection strategy, or a RAPS. This is the report that lists the activities that have to take place to get rid of the impairments. And currently, 49 out of 80 watersheds, the 80 major watersheds in the state, have that plan, that uh, RAPS, and it lists all the activities needed to get the impairment off and hit water quality goals. This map will be filled in by 2023 as a result of funding in the next biennium. On the right, then, uh, Bowser works with local stakeholders, such as soil and water conservation districts, to actually prioritize what is in those watershed restoration and protection strategies to figure out what would get funded first. And so that is how we avoid having random acts of conservation in the Clean Water Fund, is to focus efforts on things that are in an in approved plan. Uh, that map of one watershed, one plan uh, will be filled in by 2025. What I find especially helpful in these watershed plans is there are specific targets that need to be met to get waters to meet water quality goals and to have the, repair, the impairment removed. So on the left of this summary table, this very boring looking spreadsheet, for the Root River and the Upper Iowa, uh, this is just a summary table that sums up many other pages of specific strategies. And it says if you do these four types of things, 
at the scale indicated in parentheses by a certain year indicated on the right, you would get, uh, according to their calculations, the water quality, you'd hit the water quality goal and reduce the amount of nutrients in the water. <clears throat> Fortunately, they also estimate what it would cost to do all these things. So by 2025, every watershed in the state will have something like this, so we will know what it'll cost to get rid of all the impairments in the state. Now we recognize that most of those are not going to be finished by 2034, but we have a foundation on which to build for the future. Uh, the fun stuff is the restoration and implementation. They include things like removing barriers for fish and for free-flowing waters, removing or uh, uh, moving culvert pipes, uh, getting rid of dams, uh, increasing soil health on farms by increasing the uh, uh, infiltration capacity of soil. Um, uh, there's septic inspection and replacement is a big part of it as well. On the drinking water side of things, uh, we, we have a constitutional requirement that 5% of the Clean Water Fund must be used exclusively for drinking water. Uh, we breeze past that number quite easily, but we found that there are a lot of projects that we fund that have an indirect or direct impact on drinking water, either groundwater or surface water. Uh, in Minnesota, there are 920 community water systems that use groundwater. Uh, 500 of them are particularly susceptible to uh, contaminants getting in the well. The Department of Health, using clean water funds by the end of this year, I believe, will have uh, all of 500 systems with a drinking water source protection plan. They essentially have a zone around the wellhead and identify all the potential threats and list the things that need to be done to protect that wellhead in perpetuity. The rest of them will be finished by 2025. And then we established a goal in our strategic planning process. I forgot to mention our, um, uh, what I hope will be an award-winning strategic plan in your packet. I'm kidding. Uh, it lists uh, one big goal that we agreed with all stakeholders was possible, and that is to protect 400,000 acres around those 920 community water systems. And protect is not necessarily setting land aside. It can, in the case of drinking water, it can just make sure that we don't have stuff getting into the water. Uh, we have also committed in our new strategic plan, uh, completed uh, Monday, that we can provide financial assistance from the Clean Water Fund to actually do the stuff that's in those plans uh, at 50% by 2034. Um, that would be sub substantial. On the surface water side of things, there are 23 surface water systems in the state, including the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul and the suburbs that rely on their uh, Mississippi River water. Uh, there is a surface water assessment that already sizes up the risk to those systems. Those will be revised by 2025 with Clean Water Fund, and then there will be source water intake protection plans by 2027, which are similar to what's being done with wellhead protection. Uh, key to our efforts with the Clean Water Fund is to get at those leaking septic systems. Uh, the numbers are pretty daunting in how many there are in the state. Every year, a, certain, a new generation of septic systems fail. So we'll never get to 100% compliance <laughs> because as you inspect, you find ones that are failing. Because of the Clean Water Fund, we've been able to help counties enhance inspection, resulting in a minimum of 80% um, uh, uh, compliance. And we think we can get to 90% in the plan by 2034. Uh, private wells have been a vexing issue. Um, in the last year, the uh, health department has worked on trying to help uh, well owners figure out how to not only decide to test their well, which not everybody does, and then figure out what they need to do to get safe water if they have a synthetic or a natural substance that's in their well. Um, we have this um, custom or tradition that uh, your well is your responsibility. Sometimes what's in the well is not your fault uh, or it's naturally occurring. And so getting people to test water is a real challenge. Instead, or, uh, surveys by the Department of Health shows that people with lower incomes are less likely to get their water tested or to figure out what to do to mitigate the risk. Uh, so there is an RFP out right now that the health department has uh, seeking ways to do a pilot program to help people test well wells. In uh, Western Minnesota, you see the blue and the White Earth uh, Nation, that is uh, where arsenic is prevalent. The green in southeastern Minnesota is, is karst geology that is susceptible to nitrate contamination. So uh, we're trying to figure out what buttons to push with people to get them to test and mitigate their water, and if they need help doing that. And that's a substantial change from what we've been doing. Um, in terms of the results, uh, our uh, presentation coincides with the release of the Clean Water Fund Performance Report put together by the agencies. You have a th the thick report is in your packet there, I think. 
that has lots of indicators of how we're doing. Um, the Clean Water Council, um, I, fair to say, we nagged the agencies to include some different information that uh, is maybe more accessible to the general public, and they've done a nice job. The goal that we've been trying to uh, reach with our current land use and practices for fishable waters is to have two-thirds of our waters be fishable. We're at 61% right now, so we're not terribly far off. The goal for swimmable waters is to hit 70% of our lakes that meet a recreational use standard. We're at 64%. So that just gives you an idea of the context in which we're trying to fix those impairments. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these and just mention that we are encouraged in statute to leverage non-state funding. So for every dollar in clean water funds, 95 cents are come from other sources. That does not include a little bit of federal money. It includes a lot of federal money. Uh, but it also doesn't include all of the countless volunteer hours that are priceless, frankly, that volunteers contribute to monitoring every year. So I have a couple of examples where base funding from the Clean Water Fund helped attract other state money, particularly capital investment, and then federal money as well, and landowner contributions. Um, I'll just quickly say here on spending trends, every new dollar is pretty much going to drinking water and implementation. So the moving of dirt, protection of drinking water sources rather than into more uh, monitoring or research or planning. Those last three categories are holding steady. And then half the money from the Clean Water Fund leaves the state. It goes, uh, uh, money goes in the legacy bill to agencies, but then they often give it as competitive grants to other entities including soil and water conservation districts. And of the half that goes to non-agency partners, 87% of that goes for drinking water and projects. Um, I just wanted to end with this um, one picture of Rice Creek Watershed District. Uh, Rice Creek re-meandered this section of stream that was a stream 100 years ago. It became a ditch. And over the last five years, they have re-meandered it here in Shoreview and Arden Hills. I live in Shoreview, and my family uses our homemade redwood canoe that my family, my wife's family made 30 years ago to use in the boundary waters. Uh, just to note, don't use a homemade redwood canoe in the boundary waters. It weighs about 80 pounds. <laughs> 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 but it's great for Rice Creek. And so my family has been uh, down this section many times. When I took the job, I started looking to see what was paid for by clean water funds in my area. And I found out that this was one of them. Um, <coughs> flash forward to a year ago, I asked uh, my son, who was a uh, uh, senior in high school, what he would like to do with me before he went off to college and in the world, a father-son activity. And I thought he would say, let's take an expensive trip somewhere that you pay for and that I enjoy. Um, and he did not. He said, uh, let's paddle together down Rice Creek. Uh, this is what the Legacy Fund means to me. This is why the Clean Water Fund is the, my favorite part of the legacy <laughs> thing. And I hope it will be uh, yours in time. Uh, if you would like to find out how the Legacy Fund has affected your community, please let me know and we'll do some digging and get you some information. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Jewell. Uh, Representative Wiginius. I have some questions, Mr. Chair. Yep. I, first, I just want to tell you, I, I do the climate and- Representative Wiginius could- Sure. I'm sorry. I do the uh, Climate and Energy Committee, and uh, about a week ago, we had a um, hearing on the impact of climate change on our waters. And one of the things we talked about was the impact of climate change on drinking water. So the testimony, so to set up for that testimony, we know, we know that USGS is finding very high levels of water in the southern third of the state. And so there's pretty much consensus agreement that the potential for flooding is real this year. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. So when we talked about drinking water, I asked the question about the capacity if there's flooding in southern Minnesota, and we've had it before, what's the capacity for drink, uh, testing private wells? And apparently, we don't have the capacity. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Mr. Wiginius, I, I listened to the, the entire testimony for your hearing the other day on audio from my office. And the issue is, is daunting because the more volume of water is, the more you have to change the mathematical models on which all of these uh, watershed plans are based. And so more rain means the hill we have to climb gets higher. 
And so that does keep me awake at night. Um, in terms of the capacity to test, I have heard a couple of things, and then otherwise I'd have to uh, phone a friend from the health department here. But uh, I have heard from some folks in greater Minnesota that there isn't enough, that there aren't enough labs to test certain types of things. Uh, there's some things you could do on site. Uh, we've had good conversations with Mr. Broberg at the Well Owners Association on how to do clinics and how to help people get tested. Uh, but in terms of how to prioritize areas that might be flood prone, this spring I'd have to punt on a specific uh, answer to the health department who's here. Representative Guinness. I, I think punting is not in order right now. Very good. So we have to figure out, well, why don't we have the capacity? We've spent a billion dollars. I mean, part of it can be public capacity, part of it can be private capacity. But we don't have the private capacity because uh, uh, folks who tested wells in Alexandria, Minnesota, where I used to have my wells tested, or the lab, went out of business because there weren't enough people asking to have their labs, I mean, their water tested because there was no push by the state to have the water tested. So that's a problem. So let's just put the problem on the table. The second problem is that we don't have a method of reaching people whose wells might be polluted this spring and to tell them. And then we don't, what do we tell them? Do, you have, do we have a protocol for what we tell them? So those are the big problems there. I mean, I see that we have four minutes, and I had five questions. So uh, let me just. If, if Representative Wiginius, uh, I, I would hope that uh, Mr. Jewell or uh, Mr. Gardner would be more than willing, I, I would hope, to come back. And we can, I, I'd hate to limit the discussion, so please just at, we'll finish out the clock today, and we'll have them back, and we can we can visit more. So take your time, and uh, there's others that have questions. Representative Murphy has questions. Representative Vertle has questions. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Yep. Maybe I can just put my questions on the table so you're ready when you come back. Might and I? Uh, uh, so um, my next question would be about you're talking about surface water health. But you don't test surface water for drinking water contaminants. So we don't know whether the surface water is healthy. So I say that because my constituents, at least in Minneapolis, and I'll be St. Paul too, uh, drink surface water along with, and you did say there are 25 utilities in the state that use surface water for drinking water. We have no protocols for testing those surface waters to see what's in this them. And it just threw me at the beginning when you said we are, there are only three big contaminants of concern that you had, and that was, you know, phosphorus and, and nitrate <coughs> and um, what else was it? Whatever. Because that's not what I'm worried about for my drinking water, and that's not what I'm worried about for my constituents. So I, we got, and Nick, you all can talk about this later. This was on your website, this neonics in surface water. Nothing in this <clears throat> talks about neonics in surface water. And you talk about three of them are in several state rivers and streams approach or exceed limits for these pesticides. And this is all about pollinators. And of course, we should be worried about pollinators. But what about people who drink the water? So that will be another question. What about issues that I can't see in your report that are real problems for our drinking water, Minneapolis and St. Paul? Then uh, PFOSs, you don't have standards for PFOS at this late date. And NDMA, you don't have standards for that. So. All through here, I see that water needs to be fishable and swimmable, but we've dropped the word drinkable. And that doesn't work for those of us who actually drink the water. So then the last thing I'll put on um, the table 
We talk about drinking water here, and by 2027, you will have plans for source water intake. 20 years after we spent a billion dollars over that in Clean Water Fund, and now we're going to wait till 27, 2027 to have plans for drinking water? That's not acceptable. No way is that acceptable. So we'll hear. I know other people have questions. Those are mine. So, Mr. Jerry, Joel, and uh, just, I, mean, I yep. just want to say one thing because I do think the issue of drinking water from private wells, but also the drinking water for all Minnesotans, is high on our priority list. It's been a major part of our conversation as. Uh, a, uh, a committee for the last several years, in part driven by Representative Wagenius' questions of us. So I think it would be helpful. Our meeting on Monday specifically was focused on drinking water. And one of the issues is what do we do related to assuring that private wells are tested and that people have the money to uh, do something if they find out that that water uh, has problems. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, we've kind of met our time, and uh, I just would like to affirm you're open to coming back. I hope uh, to have further discussion. And uh, my apologies to uh, Representative Murphy. I know you had a question, and uh, Representative Erdahl as well had a question, and uh, um, had to had to step out for another meeting. I'm certain. Um, with that, uh, oh, Representative Murphy. Could I just ask my question? And yes. Then... The report card, was the report card done by the same people that did the performance report? Mr. Gardner. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, that's correct. So it's... Representative Murphy. It's not really a report card. It's kind of a summary of the report. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Gardner. Gardner, that's correct. Thank you all for um, a, a good meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, water folks, for coming today, and uh, we'll invite you back again to further conversation.